Shortly after the Jews left Egypt, God uh, directed Moses to select certain men to go ahead and to spy out, spy out the land of Canaan in order to prepare for their arrival and settlement. The idea was they were, they were freed through miracles you know, from Egypt and they were to just go straight to the promised land. You know, this, this, this was the original, the original plan here. Now Moses didn't just pick volunteers. He carefully selected 12 men who were already leaders among the people. And I'd like to kind of under, underline that idea. It says, so Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the sons of Israel. So this wasn't, hey, send me. Please, Moses, Moses, send me. I want to, that wasn't one of those. These men were selected by God through Moses because they were already leaders. We read in the following chapters about their mission and its results. They spied out the land and they found it lush and productive, well populated and well guarded. When they returned, 10 of the leaders tried to convince the people not to go forward because they were afraid of the military strength of the people who were in the land that they had just spied out. Let's not go there. These people, uh, you know, they're big, they're tough, they're mean, they're well guarded, they're giants. However, two of the leaders, Joshua and Caleb, encouraged the people to rely on the Lord for victory in taking the land. Because of this dispute, the fear of these 10 leaders expressed to the people resulted in the people revolting against Moses and actually trying to head back to Egypt. As a result, God punished them by declaring that they would not go into the promised land, but instead they would wander in the desert for 40 years. The idea being one year for each day the spies were in the land. And we find that information in the book of Numbers. It says, your sons shall be shepherds for 40 years in the wilderness and they will suffer for your unfaithfulness until your corpses lie in the wilderness. According to the number of days which you spied out the land, 40 days, for every day you shall bear your guilt a year, even 40 years, and you will know my opposition. So in the end, the entire generation that was over 20 years of age at that time of the revolt died in the desert and only their children entered into the promised land because the people had used the safety of their children as an excuse not to go forward when they had a chance. They said, we can't go forward, it's too dangerous. We've got to protect our children. We don't want our children to be killed you know, in, in war and so on and so forth. And the irony of it is they all died in the desert and their children that they were afraid for, they went into the land. They went into the land. When the moment finally came to cross over into the promised land, four decades later, only Joshua and Caleb were left of that generation who entered into their new home. This was a gift from God for their faithful leadership. Now, even though this episode occurred nearly 3,500 years ago, it still has some challenging lessons to teach us about leadership today, in our day. I call it lessons from the spies. In the same way that Moses selected the leaders among the people to carry out important tasks, the church today selects people to leadership positions in order to do God's work among the brethren. These include, of course, elders 
and deacons and teachers and preachers, especially with the changes that are taking place here at Choctaw that began last year when I retired from staff ministry. We hired and promoted uh, Tyus West, for example, to be our youth and family minister. And now we are poised to add the associate minister, uh, John Arvin, who in effect is, is, replacing, is replacing me. All of these have been selected to provide leadership of one kind or another over the spiritual and the physical welfare of this church. Those who lead need to pay careful attention to the lessons taught by former leaders that we read about in God's word. These 12 spies, for example, teach us three basic lessons that all of God's leaders must know if they are to succeed in the task and the role that God, that God has placed them in. It isn't just the church that places leaders into their position, it's God that places them through the church into their positions of leadership. So three lessons that all leaders need to follow. The first lesson is that leaders lead. Leaders lead. These men were not asked you know, in, in Moses' time, these 12 men, they weren't asked to stay home at the camp and just boss everybody around. That wasn't their task. To use a famous line from a popular TV series of long ago, they were asked to go where no one had gone before. That's the point of leadership. That's what makes the leader a leader, he goes ahead to explore, to find out, to chart, to experience what is ahead. In practical terms, it means that those who lead in education, for example, need to be examining uh, what we will and what we should be learning in the future. Or those who lead us in maintenance, for example, should be preventing breakdowns, not just fixing breakdowns. We need to be thinking ahead, just to name a few examples. People look to leaders for direction and leaders cannot give direction from the back of the pack. They have to be ahead in order to lead effectively. When leaders don't lead, when they're not at least a step ahead spiritually and organizationally, the church stands still or it takes a wrong turn or it begins to divide. Second lesson, leaders motivate. In the story of the spies, it was the agreement of the 10 cowardly leaders that convinced the people not to go, and then eventually to revolt. Like it or not, people reflect the attitude of their leaders. If the leaders are lazy, the people will not accomplish much. If the leaders are not committed, the people will not feel the need to commit themselves either. The people will show the relative strengths and weaknesses of their leaders. The results will be inconsistency. For example, the church will be strong in the areas where the leaders are strong and they'll be weak in the areas where the leaders are weak. Leaders need to understand how powerful their influence is for good and for evil. Satan's best scheme is to convince leaders that they really have no influence. So if they slack off or if they cut corners, nobody will ever notice. Of course, this is a lie, like all of his other lies, because the church notices the neglect of its leaders. 
And fellow leaders notice the extra burden that they must carry because others are not carrying their own burden. And the Lord notices poor stewardship when he sees it. Which brings me to the third lesson, and that is leaders pay. God has always held leaders accountable for their leadership. The 10 unfaithful cowardly spies died in dishonor in the desert. And the two faithful ones made it to the promised land. It's interesting, the 12 names of these people were listed in the book of Numbers when they were chosen for their mission. But today, people name their sons after only two of these men, Joshua and Caleb, because only these two distinguished themselves as leaders. It's nice to be chosen, to have the elders pray and introduce you to the church. It's nice to have your name and your ministry listed in the bulletin or up on the, you know, the, uh, the sign out front you know, as, as a leader in the church is nice. However, there will be a time of accountability for this role. One day, you'll have to pay the price for leadership. God will require you to answer how well you served as one of his leaders. Okay, so just how does a leader become a leader? It's very easy to criticize, very easy to you know, pick out weaknesses. I don't mean to just harbor on that idea. How do leaders become leaders? Although the information is not included in the story of the spies, the Bible does support the idea that leaders are made and not born. One doesn't simply become a leader able to lead and motivate and be responsible on the day of appointment. Becoming a leader requires that an individual practice and develop certain leadership techniques and skills. If you are in a leadership role now, or if you aspire to be a leader, then there are some basic things you absolutely have to do in order to succeed. Number one, you have to master yourself. I can't emphasize this enough. You have to master yourself. You can't lead others if you can't lead yourself. What usually separates leaders from followers is that leaders are usually better able to control themselves. Listen to two Christian leaders and what they said about this particular issue. The first one being Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. He says, but I discipline my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Paul, the leading missionary, understood the necessity of mastering his desires and his weaknesses so that after all of his good work, he would not be swept away by personal temptation to sin. He knew that even leaders could fall and they needed to control themselves. Another leader, James, in chapter three of his epistle says, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such, we will incur a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. James, a leader in the church at Jerusalem, warns leaders, especially teachers, that leadership requires mastery over what one says and what one does. People need to see an example of what spiritual maturity and Christian conduct is like. Christian leaders provide this by demonstrating a greater measure of self mastery than the ones that they lead. Leaders are not perfect, of course, 
but they have gained a mastery over their tongues and conduct to a point where it is obvious to others. True Christian leaders motivate others to copy them, to point to them as examples of what they want to become themselves in Jesus Christ. Another thing you as a leader need to do to develop leadership skills, you need to devote yourself, understand the uh, function of devotion. I remember a lesson by the late Robert George. Remember Robert George, a wonderful man. He was a deacon here. He was in charge of World Bible School for many years. Anyways, he told the story of a boy uh, who loved riding his bike. And he went on and on about how this little boy rode his bike and he, he put it in his bedroom at night and you know, he took care of his bike. Uh, it was his favorite thing. And then he says, one day the little boy was hit by a car and he died of his injuries. And his parents decided to bury his bicycle with him in his grave because he so loved riding it. And then Robert asked us, the congregation, what will be buried next to us when our turn comes? Will it be our cars? Our soccer schedules, our phones, our TV, perhaps a favorite bow or a gun or a rod or an animal, music tools, computers, whatever. In other words, when people gather to remember us, what will they remember that was most important to us in our lives? As he put it, what will be our magnificent obsessions? Let's face it you know what you're known for. For leaders in the church, it can be a number of things. You could be known for the list of people that you have visited or taught or served. You can be known for the Bible that you preached and defended. You can be known for the projects that you worked on and organized in order to serve the congregation. Or you can be known for being absent for being out of duty, for being unkind, for being unorganized. One thing's for certain, the single most identifying characteristic of leaders in the church is the devotion they have to the Lord's body. Others may be more skilled as teachers. Others may be better you know, people persons, but no one is more devoted to the overall well-being and success and growth of the church than, it, than its leaders. That's the way things should be. You see, brothers and sisters, you can't fake devotion. You can't fake that. Christ, he died for the church. Paul, he was tortured for the church. Peter was martyred as one of its leaders. This was not simply circumstances or bad timing on their part. This happened to them as an example to other leaders who would come after. To what extent God could demand your service as a leader in his church if he wanted to. If the leaders can't devote themselves to regular attendance or extra giving of time and money, they will fall dreadfully short on that day when the Lord asks them to do something really dynamic, like perhaps suffer for the faith or even perhaps die for it. If leaders are not devoted to the church, devoted to their ministries, then how can members be expected to commit themselves? Devotion is a learned thing. Leaders learn it from Christ. Followers learn it at first from their leaders. And so to become a, a good leader, you have to master yourself. You have to devote yourself and then you have to reproduce yourself. 
The first goal of leadership, as I've explained, is to provide direction and motivation through example and teaching and service. The second goal of leadership is to train others to be leaders. We read in Matthew 28, 20, you know, Jesus says, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. He commanded them to teach others. Who would teach others? Who would teach others? Generation after generation. Paul explains it in another way. He says, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Get the cycle going. Leaders need to know their jobs well and demonstrate that they can do their jobs well. And then they have to find others to train and to develop as leaders. Barnabas was an early church leader who mentored Paul. Then Paul was a church leader who trained Timothy. This multiplication process is how the church grows and how new churches get planted. You know, churches that fail to develop new leaders fail to develop. If we have no new elders or no new deacons, if we don't plant any new churches and send out any new missionaries, we're not going to be operating according to the New Testament. We can call ourselves a New Testament church, but we're not operating like one. Leaders fulfill their roles when they are reproducing themselves and hopefully reproducing better models for leadership. So let's kind of bring this home, shall we? When I measure growth, our growth, I don't only look at our baptisms or attendance or contribution. These are important factors, but they're not the only factors. I also look at personal spiritual growth that's taking place. For example, has so-and-so given up their bad habit yet? You know, brother or sister, I love you, I love you dearly, but I'm waiting for you to give up your bad slappy, uh, sloppy attitude. I'm waiting for you to give up your bad habit. I'm waiting for you to grow up in the Lord. Let's get going. I still love you to death, but I sure wish you'd grow up. I look at who's teaching this year for the first time. Are we still relying on the old war horses? Are we dragging them out of the barn every quarter to teach? Where are the new teachers? Where are the ones who've said, you know, in the last several months I've been studying this particular thing and uh, I'd like to present it to the congregation and here's my outline, uh, brother so-and-so elder, and you know, can I have a chance? I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that from anyone. In 10 years I haven't heard it. I ask myself, which couple decided to stay together because it was the right thing to do? And what member has begun to attend Bible class in addition to worship? What member has started coming Sunday nights? What member has stepped forward and said, you know, just sitting there is not enough. I, I want to serve the communion or I want to be a greeter. Or, I don't know, I want to do something. The list goes on and on and on. Both numerical and personal spiritual growth are impossible without growth in leadership first. And there's no growth in leadership unless there is an obvious effort being made at self mastery. There's no growth in leadership unless there are obvious signs of superior devotion to the Lord's church and its work. It's embarrassing when a newly baptized member is more faithful to the assembly than one of our leaders. There is an obvious plan to reduce, uh, excuse me, to reproduce leadership. That's another 
hopeful sign. That's why when uh, Brother Marty came up and said, okay, we've, we've hired this young guy, people <gasps> took a bit of a breath. People said, amen, yes, got excited, yes, new blood, let's go. Of course, the natural temptation at this point is to get mad and quit. I mean, if leadership is this demanding, who needs it? It's such a thankless job anyways. I just ask my wife in 40 years how many times I've come home and said, oh man, I can't do this anymore. I just, I can't. I just... Why? You teach somebody, you work with them, you study with them, you're at their house, it's cold, it's dark, you go anyways and you counsel and you, and you teach them and they do this and, and it's great and two years and three years go by and they want to teach a class and they teach a class and blah, 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 blah. And four and a half years down the road, they quit, they leave, they abandon the church because somebody said something they didn't like. And you say to yourself, four and a half years, I've invested in that guy. For what? So I'm telling you, I get it. There are days phew, you just, you just, you want to quit. It's a thankless job at times in many instances. And it's very demanding and it's almost impossible. However, God calls his leaders not to be afraid and not to be faithless. He calls them to lean on him and trust him and follow him. He reminds all leaders that all will be possible with faith and all will be rewarded in due time. You know, the Jews, they would have taken the land if they would have followed Caleb and Joshua so I ask everyone to examine themselves this morning in order to see what step needs to be taken in your life so that you can demonstrate Christian leadership at your level, whether it be in your home or in your workplace, in your school, in your circle of friends. You know, God needs people to be leaders in the saying and the doing of good in this world. What do you need to do to become his leader in your circle today? And I also ask our leaders in this congregation, elders and teachers and ministers and deacons and staff people and ministry, a lot of people coordinate ministries. I ask you to also examine yourselves and see if your leadership is all it needs to be in order to lead God's people here at Choctaw. In these tumultuous times, know that the church needs someone to step forward and declare the words that throughout history have begun every resurgence of God's kingdom here on earth. And those words are, here I am, Lord. You finish it. 